Greetings and welcome to an LGR thing, and this is the E Machines E1 433, released in August of 1999 for 849 US dollars. Although it was available for way less because that's what eMachines did. There's a $50 mail-in rebate and then there was a $400 rebate if you signed up for three years of CompuServe 2000 dial-up internet for $21.95 a month. And yes, one of these things is not like the other. The obvious, let's state it, this was built explicitly to cash in on the late 90s Apple iMac craze, complete with a not Bondi blue translucent color scheme. Gosh, they just look so similar. I can't tell which is the real one and which is the knockoff. And I gotta give a huge thank you to Douglas for donating this. These are not commonplace machines at all, and for good reason. Not only was the E1 originally sold exclusively through Circuit City stores in the US, but Apple sued the crap out of them for daring to make such a blatant iMac ripoff. And that's a suit that they won and settled in March of 2000, with eMachines agreeing to cease all sales of the E1 as a result. And Apple did not stop there either. They also sued SoTech, the Japanese firm who co-developed the E1 with eMachines, and was also selling their own version of the E1 in Japan. Within a month, the Tokyo District Court ordered SoTech to cease all production. And finally, Apple also sued Korean firm Daeyu. Due to their own iMac knockoff, the ePower PC, all sales of the ePower PC were barred by a judge in San Jose, California, and Apple won a worldwide injunction against all sales of the ePower PC, as well as our eMachines E1. So yeah, the fact that I have one of these banned things in my possession is pretty wild to me, considering it was only on the market a few months, and apparently didn't sell very well even when it was legal to do so. But before Apple buried them with litigation, eMachines marketed this as a computer for people who dug the aesthetic and form factor of Apple's hugely popular Bondi Blue iMac, but wanted to run Windows 98 instead of Mac OS 9. It was also less costly than an iMac by several hundred dollars, while technically including more features and higher specs. For example, you got a 433 MHz Intel Celeron processor, 100 MHz more than the 99 Revision D iMac, as well as 64 MB of PC100 SD RAM, twice that of the iMac, an 8 MB ATI RAGE XL AGP graphics chipset, two more megs than the iMac, and a 6.4 or 8.4 GB IDE hard drive, again up to twice that of a base model iMac. They even included a keyboard that more closely resembled Apple's keyboard than anything on the PC side of things at the time, which is not a good thing in this case. The layout is weird and cramped and it just feels plasticky and gummy to the fingertips, even compared to the Apple board, which I'm not super fond of either. And instead of putting USB ports on each side like the iMac, eMachines went with dual PS2 ports instead. Reminiscent of what Apple used to do with ADB, you plug in a male-to-male -male cable on either side and then the mouse in the opposite port. This means you can daisy chain both devices into just one compatible PS2 port if you want. Although redundant in this case, since it has the individual ports on the computer itself. Still, eMachines drew the line at copying Apple's famous hockey puck mouse, thank goodness. I don't have the original mouse from the E1, but you can see what it looks like here. It's just a stylized mouse to fit with the rest of it. I actually ran across this Kensington mouse that looks like it was made for the E1 at Goodwill a while back, so that's what I'll be using here. This color scheme of translucent dark teal was just super popular at the time. And then one of the biggest boasts of the E1 was that it had a 3.5 inch floppy disk drive, a feature which the iMac famously omitted due to them betting on the future being USB. A future Apple was correct about. But hey, the E1 has USB and a floppy drive, so that means it's better, right? Eh, at least it had a 24-speed CD-ROM drive, although with a non-motorized tray, not as impressive as the fancy slot-loading mechanism of the late 1999 iMac. But hey, the iMac didn't have this chintzy pop-out panel that reveals CD player controls with a monochrome LCD panel. How's that for some late 90s technological curb appeal? 
Or what about this little spot for connecting 3.5mm audio jacks and a USB device in the front? Or around to the right side where you see these composite video inputs? Yeah, that's right, the E1 has video capture capability. There's no tuner, so you'll need something with a composite output, so VCRs or cable TV boxes, or a game console. Yeah, that's right, you want to plug in your Sega Genesis to your E-Machines E1? You can do that. Resolution is not great and the colors are severely washed out, but hey, it's here and it's pretty awesome actually. Also on this right-hand side of the machine, underneath a sliding panel, you even got some expandability, an elusive thing in all-in-ones like this. Granted, it came in the form of PCM CIA slots, normally seen on laptops, so upgrade options were kinda limited. But yeah, this is also where you'll find the I.O. section for things like 10 base t Ethernet, a 56K modem and fax connection, RS-232 serial port, another USB port, two PS2 ports, and speaker output for the Cirrus Logic CS4280 sound chip that is supposedly Sound Blaster 16 compatible, but more on that in a moment. And finally, around the back of the machine next to the power, you get a parallel port for printers and such, and a 15-pin game port for joysticks or connecting external MIDI devices. E-Machines also imitated the carrying handle on top like the iMac, but it's pretty awful. It's made of cheap plastic with sharp edges that kind of feel like it'll slice your hand, and every time you lift it up, it detaches itself from the plastic on the front of the case. I'm gonna hazard a guess and say build quality was not on the agenda. There's also this terrible little microphone built into the top of the monitor housing. And yeah, just check it out. This thing is, <laughs> it's not good. Testing this crappy microphone. Testing this crappy microphone. <laughs> Still, shoddy quality aside, you got what appeared on paper to be a fine list of features housed in an attractive case that included a 15-inch CRT and stereo speakers. A rather soft CRT with lackluster color reproduction and speakers that sound cheap and tinny, but yeah, an attempt was made. Speaking of speakers, let's talk about sound. You know the Sound Blaster 16 compatibility I mentioned? Well, it's kinda here. Just listen to it trying to play Duke Nukem 3D's theme song. Well, in case you didn't notice, it's missing half the notes. That's awkward. Damn, those alien bastards are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. It is at least pretty decent at doing PCM sound effects through Sound Blaster emulation, but when I use this, I swear you can hear a Yamaha engineer crying somewhere in the distance. This is seriously one of the worst FM synth emulations I've ever heard. Just listen to Canyon.mid. And no, in case you're wondering, it does not have any general MIDI or wavetable audio on board. Or at least if it is, the drivers that this one came with do not support it. But as you saw the connection earlier, you can connect external MIDI devices if you really wanted to. Also interesting is that there are zero monitor controls on the case. You have to do all the color, brightness, and geometry adjustment through a control panel plug-in. That's not the most unusual thing, but even the degaussing is done through software. That's something I'd never seen before. And yeah, despite a lot of crap, I mean, as far as late 90s Windows games and software, it runs that stuff pretty okay. At least for a 433 MHz Celeron with an integrated 8 meg ATI Rage card. So, you know, games like StarCraft are totally fine. Games like Quake 3 are not. But it's playable, so that's something. It was also available with a 500 MHz CPU, so assuming it's not soldered to the board or something stupid like that, I guess you could upgrade this thing. But that's something that I'm not going to dare doing. I tried opening this up and it was an absolute nightmare. It's almost like you had to destroy parts of it to get to what you really wanted to do. And it's not personally worth it to me to bother with that. So 433 MHz it is. And that is the E-Machines E1. What a piece of junk.
but an incredibly fascinating piece of junk with a tarnished, legally dubious legacy. And you know what? I'm just kind of partial to this translucent colored plastic that happened on several computers and technology products of the time. It's admittedly cheesy and maybe even a bit off-putting, but at the same time, oddly attractive and very much nostalgic. And you know, I just like all-in-ones, so I like messing with this thing and uh, yeah, that's about it. I got no excuses, I'm just weird. Speaking of weird, there was a follow-up of sorts for the E1 by Gateway, who purchased E-Machines in 2004, and I guess they liked the name and the idea, so they released the Gateway 1 in 2007. And thankfully this didn't seem to infringe on any other iMac trademarks or design disputes or anything like that, because it was sold and forgotten, and uh, well, that's not a happy ending either. But anyway, that's all for this video, and I hope that you enjoyed watching what you just did. I always like taking a look at bizarre computers from the past and just talking about them if I can get my hands on them. And I've got a lot more to talk about in the future, so stick around. There are new videos every Monday and Friday here on LGR. And as always, thank you very much for watching.